Modules in Homological Algebra, Lecture 1, Recap of Algebraic Structures. Let us start with a brief description of the course. The course is divided into four parts, and each part consists of five lectures and one problem session. Here are the contents of each of these four parts. The first part is about free algebraic structures. The second part is about modules over principal ideal domains. The third part is about categories. And the last part is about homological algebra. So let us start with part one, which is about free algebraic structures. And today's lecture one will be just a recap about algebraic structures. We start with the most basic al algebraic structure that is a semigroup. A semigroup is a tuple which consists of two things, a non-empty set S and a binary operation on S denoted by dot. So it's a map from the Cartesian product of S with itself to S. This datum is supposed to satisfy the following axiom. Our binary operation should be associative. This means the following, if we multiply some element A, with the product of the elements B and C, the outcome should be the same as if we multiplied the product of the elements A and B with C. Some remarks, the pair S comma dot is usually denoted just by S and the product A dot B is usually denoted simply by A B. Here are some examples. The numerical semigroups, the semigroup of all positive integers with respect to addition. Addition is clearly associative. The semigroup of all non-negative integers with respect to multiplication. The multiplication, we also know that it is associative. The semigroup of all rational numbers with respect to multiplication or with respect to addition, and so on. There are many natural numerical semigroups consisting of some kind of numbers with respect to the usual arithmetic operations of addition or multiplication. Here is example two. For a non-empty set X, consider the set T of X of all maps from X to X. This is a semigroup with respect to the composition of maps because the composition of maps is associative. Example three, the set of all n times n matrices over a commutative ring K is a semigroup with respect to matrix multiplication. It is, of course, also a semigroup with respect to matrix addition. But the multiplication structure is more interesting and more non-trivial. And example four, the set A cross of all non-empty words in an alphabet A with respect to concatenation of words. This is also a semigroup the semigroup of words, we consider some alphabet A, non-empty alphabet A, and we consider all non-empty words in this alphabet. This is a semigroup. Next, let us talk about monoids. A monoid is a semigroup with some extra structure. So a monoid is a tuple consisting of a set M, a binary operation dot on M, and a fixed element E. In M. This datum is supposed to satisfy the following axioms. Just like for semigroups, the operation is supposed to be associative. Additionally, our fixed element E should be an identity element in M. This means that if we multiply E with any element A on any side, so an element A is an element in M, the outcome must be the element A. So E acts neutrally with respect to multiplication. Just like for semigroups, the whole tuple denoting a monoid M is usually denoted simply by M. And in this case, the operation and the unit element or the identity element, they are supposed to be understood from the context. And the product A dot B is usually denoted by A B. Here is a small lemma. Let M be a monoid, and little m is an element in big M, which has the property that it's an identity element. 
So m times a is equal to a times m is equal to m for any a in m. Then m must be equal to the identity element E in the monoid M. So this means that the identity element in a monoid is really unique. Not only it is given from the very definition of the monoid directly, but there are no other elements which can serve such a role in a given monoid. Proof. On the one hand, M times E is equal to M by the axiom for our identity element E. So this is this axiom. On the other hand, M times E is equal to E by our assumption on M, by this assumption. So M is equal to E. This completes the proof. Here are some examples. The numerical monoids, the monoid of all non-negative integers with respect to addition and with zero, being the identity element. Also, the monoid of all positive integers with respect to multiplication and with the identity element one being the identity element. Similarly, all rational numbers with respect to multiplication and one being the unit element, and so on. Example two, the set of all maps from a fixed set X to itself with respect to the composition of maps. We know that this is a semigroup. It is also a monoid where the neutral element is the identity map IDX on X. So this identity map operates in the following way. Applied to some element Y in X, it produces this element Y. It doesn't do anything for the elements in X. Example three. The set of all n times n matrices over a commutative ring K, we know that this is a semigroup with respect to matrix multiplication. It is even a monoid if for the identity element we take the identity matrix. So this is a diagonal matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Example four, the set A star of all words in the alphabet A with respect to concatenation of words. So here, we assume that we also include here the empty word, which will then become the identity element with respect to the concatenation of words. So in more details, a word in A is just a string of letters, W1, W2, and so on, WK, where all WIs are in A. And if K is equal to zero, we get the empty words. So it is the empty string of letters. And concatenation is usual if we concatenate the word W1, W2, and so on, WK, with the word U1, U2, and so on, UM. We get the word W1, W2, and so on, WK, U1, U2, and so on, UM. So this is the explanation of this example in more detail. Next, let us talk about groups. A group is a tuple which consists of a set G a binary operation dot on G. So this is, again, a binary operation, just like for monoids or semigroups, and a fixed element E in G. So it's very similar to a monoid. This datum is supposed to satisfy the following axioms. First of all, the operation should be associative, just like for semigroups and monoids. The element E should be an identity element with respect to this operation, just like for monoids. In particular, each group is a monoid from what is now on the screen. But we have one additional axiom for groups. For each element A in G, there should exist an element B in G, such that the product A dot B and B dot A, both these products should be equal to E. So this is the axiom of the existence of inverses. The element B is the inverse of the element A. Just like in the previous cases, the groups are usually denoted by the set underlying the group, and the operation is usually shortened just to write in AB instead of A dot B. Just like for monoids, the identity element is unique. This is because any group is a monoid. Moreover, one can show that each element A has a unique inverse. So for each A, the B, which is given by the third axiom, is really unique. And it is usually denoted by A inverse, 
in the case when the operation in the group is understood as some kind of multiplication, alternatively, it is denoted by minus a if the operation in the group is some kind of addition. Here are some examples. So the numerical groups, all integers with respect to addition with zero, all real numbers with respect to addition with zero, or complex numbers with respect to addition with zero. All these are additive groups. With respect to multiplication, we know that zero doesn't have multiplicative inverse, so we have to throw it away. So we have the following examples, all rational numbers, which are non-zero with respect to multiplication and with the identity element as a unit element. Similarly, all non-zero real numbers with respect to multiplication and with the identity element, all non-zero complex numbers with respect to multiplication and with the identity element. Next, the matrix groups, the group of all invertible n times n matrices with rational coefficients with respect to matrix multiplication and with the identity matrix as the unit element. And we can change coefficients to real numbers or to complex numbers. Next is the symmetric group, the group of all invertible maps from x to x, where x is the set, with respect to the composition of maps and with the identity map as the unit element. The special case is the symmetric group Sn, and this is when the set X is taken to be the set consisting of 1, 2, 3, and so on up to n. So this is a set of n elements, and these elements are actually the first n integers, 1, 2, and so on, n. The next case is just groups of symmetries of geometric objects. So if you have a geometric object, we have the symmetries of this geometric object, like rotations and reflections. So these are maps of the space in which these geometric objects live, which are isometries of that space, and with respect to the composition of maps and with the identity map as the unit element. Here is a special case, the dihedral group, the dihedral group D to N, where N is an integer greater than or equal to three, so this is a group of linear symmetries of the regular n gon inscribed in the unit circle in R2, such that one of the vertices of this n gon is the vertex 1, 0. So here is the example for n is equal to 3. We have the triangle inscribed in the unit circle. One of the vertices here is 1, 0. And this has three rotational symmetries, the identity map moving this vertex to here, or moving this vertex to here. And then it also has three reflection symmetries. We can reflect with respect to the horizontal line, we can reflect with respect to this line, and we can reflect with respect to this line. So this group is D2 times 3. It has six elements. Next, let us talk about rings. Definition, a ring is a tuple which consists of the following things. First of all, we have a set R, a binary operation dot on R, a fixed element in R, usually denoted by one, a binary operation plus on R, and a fixed element of R, which is denoted by zero. So we have a set, some kind of multiplication on this set, some kind of addition on this set, and then fixed elements one and zero. This datum is supposed to satisfy the following axioms. First of all, with respect to multiplication and the element one, we have a monoid. Next, with respect to addition and the element zero, we have a group. Moreover, this group is commutative in the sense that for any A and B in R, A plus B is equal to B plus A. And finally, the addition and the multiplication in R are connected by distributivity. So if we multiply the sum of A plus B with C on the right, then the outcome is equal to AC plus BC. And similarly, if we multiply A plus B with C on the left, we get CA plus CB for all A, B, and C. 
And as usual, the whole tuple is usually denoted by the underlying set R if the operations and the identity elements are clear from the context. Here are some examples. The most basic example of a ring is the ring of integers. So we have all integers with respect to multiplication, the unit element one, and with respect to addition and the zero element, zero. Remark, a ring R is called commutative, provided that the multiplication is commutative. So addition in the ring is always commutative by the axioms, but the multiplication doesn't have to be commutative. If it is commutative, the ring is called a commutative ring. So in other words, a ring is commutative, provided that AB is equal to BA for all AB in R. For example, we have the ring of all n times n matrices with respect to the matrix multiplication and addition, the identity matrix and the zero matrix, and we can take matrices with coefficients in any commutative ring. The ring of n times n matrices will usually be not commutative, so if n is greater than 1, the ring of matrices is not commutative, even if the underlying ring of the coefficients is commutative. Example 3, we have the commutative polynomial ring over some commutative ring k. So we have all polynomials over k with respect to multiplication of polynomials, the unit polynomial just a constant 1, the addition of polynomials, and the zero polynomial, the constant 0. Example 4, if we have a vector space v over some field k, we will talk about fields in a moment. So if we have a vector space over some field k, then the set of all linear endomorphisms of V with respect to the composition of maps, the identity map, the addition of linear endomorphisms and the zero map on V is a ring. So here K is a field, V is a vector space over K, so and V is the set of all linear endomorphisms of V. The circ is the composition of maps, so the multiplication in this ring is the composition of maps. IDV is the identity map on V, so this is a neutral element with respect to the composition of maps. And 0V is a zero map on V, so this is a linear map which maps all the elements in V to the zero element in V. This is a neutral element with respect to addition of linear maps. So this is yet another example of a ring. This ring is not commutative, provided that the dimension of V is greater than 1. Now let us talk about fields. Definition, a field is a commutative ring in which every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. For example, the set of all rational numbers, the set of all real numbers, or the set of all complex numbers with respect to the usual addition and multiplication, these are fields. Another example of the field is the field of all rational functions over some field k. So what is a rational function? A rational function is an equivalence class of expressions of the form f of x divided by g of x, where f and g are polynomials in k, and the denominator g is a non-zero polynomial, but we don't just take these expressions, we take equivalence classes of the expressions where the equivalence relation is given as follows. So the fraction f of x divided by g of x is equivalent to the fraction f tilde of x divided by g tilde of x, if and only if the cross product, the product f of x times g tilde of x is equal to the product f tilde of x times g of x. The multiplication here is the usual multiplication of fractions. f divided by g times f tilde divided by g tilde is defined as f times f tilde divided by g times g tilde. And the addition is more complicated. This is the usual addition of fractions. f divided by g plus f tilde divided by g tilde is equal to f g tilde plus g f tilde divided by g g tilde. Okay, finally, let us talk about algebras. Let K be a field. 
A K algebra is a tuple which consists of a K vector space, let's call it A, a binary operation on A, and a fixed element 1 of A. This datum is supposed to satisfy the following axioms. The operation should be K bilinear and associative, and the element 1 should be a unit element with respect to this operation. As usual, the whole tuple is usually denoted by the underlying set if the operation and the identity element are clear from the context. And of course, every algebra A is a ring with respect to the additional structure given by the addition on A. A is a vector space, so it has the addition and the zero element of A. So each algebra is a ring, but not vice versa in general. So here are some examples. We have the polynomial algebra kx over a field with respect to the usual multiplication of polynomials. We have the algebra of all n times n matrices over some field k. We have the algebra of all linear endomorphisms of some vector space over a field k. So the field of complex numbers has as a subfield the field of real numbers. So we can consider the field of complex numbers as an algebra over the field of real numbers. Similarly, complex numbers is an algebra over the field of rational numbers. Next example, which one can see in the course representation theory of finite groups. If we have a group G, then we have the corresponding group algebra K of G. So this group algebra K of G is a K vector space with a distinguished basis given by the elements in G. The multiplication is induced from the multiplication in G by bilinearity, and the associativity follows from the associativity of the multiplication in G. And the identity element in K of G is the identity element in G. So it's a formal linear combination of all elements in G, all coefficients are zero, except for the coefficient 1 next to the identity element. And finally, let us talk about a more general set of examples of algebras, which are called quiver algebras. So what is a quiver? A quiver is the same thing as an oriented graph. So it consists of vertices and oriented edges. We will consider only finite quivers, which means quivers which have finitely many vertices and finitely many edges. So for example, so here is a quiver with three vertices and two edges. So here is a quiver which contains one edge, which is loop. So we allow loops, we allow multiple edges, we allow edges going in different directions, as many loops as we wish, and so on. But we only consider finite quivers. So here are some natural examples of quivers. Given a quiver Q, a path in Q is a word over the alphabet of all arrows in Q, which has the following property. So the word is alpha k, alpha k minus 1, and so on, alpha 1. The property is that the ending vertex of each alpha i should coincide with the starting vertex of the corresponding alpha i plus 1. Convention, for every vertex i, we have the trivial or empty pass, which you will denote by EI at that vertex. So this pass starts from this vertex, it ends this vertex, but it doesn't have any arrows in it. So it's the empty word in that vertex. So for example, if we have this quiver, the three vertices 1 to 3, the arrow alpha from 1 to 2, and the arrow beta from 2 to 3, here is a list of all passes in this quiver. So we have the trivial pass E1 at the vertex 1, we have the trivial pass E2 at the vertex 2, and we have the trivial pass E3 at the vertex 3. So we have the pass alpha, just the arrow alpha, from 1 to 2, we have the pass beta from 2 to 3, and we have the path beta alpha from 1 to 3. So for this quiver, we have six different paths. We can concatenate passes just as we concatenate words, but with some additional care. So let Q be a quiver and assume that we have two passes in Q. 
So alpha k, alpha k minus 1, and so on, alpha 1. And beta m, beta m minus 1, and so on, beta 1. If the ending vertex of beta m coincides with the starting vertex of alpha 1, we define their concatenation at the pass which we obtain by writing one word after the other. Otherwise, which is in the case if the ending vertex of beta m does not coincide with the starting vertex of alpha 1, we define the concatenation to be 0. 0 is just a special symbol which is not a label for any arrow or any vertex in our quiver. So, for example, for the quiver consisting of three vertices 1, 2, and 3, and two arrows alpha from 1 to 2 and beta from 2 to 3, we have that concatenation of beta after alpha is equal to beta alpha. This is because the ending point of alpha coincides with the starting point of beta. It's the vertex 2. But if you try to concatenate in the opposite direction, alpha after beta, we will get 0, because the ending point of beta, which is 3, does not coincide with the starting point of alpha, which is 1. Alpha after E1 is equal to alpha. E1 is a trivial pass at 1, and its ending point 1 is a starting point of alpha. At the same time, alpha after E2 is 0, because the ending point of the trivial pass E2 is 2, and the starting point of alpha is 1. So this is just the example of concatenation of paths. Now, when we define the concatenation, we can define the pass semi group. Let Q be a quiver, and let P sub Q be the set of all paths in Q, together with our special symbol 0. Then the set PQ with respect to the concatenation of passes is a semigroup. So the concatenation, as the usual concatenation of words, it is associative. And of course, the usual convention is zero concatenated with zero is equal to zero. And zero concatenating with any other pass is zero. So for example, for the quiver consisting of two vertices one and two and one path alpha, we have the following multiplication table in P sub Q. So P sub Q consists of four elements, the trivial pass E1 at 1, the trivial pass E2 at 2, the pass alpha, which we have from 1 to 2, and our special element 0. And this is the concatenation table. The non-trivial, non-zero concatenations are E1, which is E1 after E1, E2, which is E2 after E2, then alpha is equal to E2 after alpha, and alpha, which is equal to alpha after E1. All other concatenations here are zero. Now, when we have defined the path semigroup of the quiver, we can define the path algebra. So let Q be a quiver and K a field. Denote by P sub Q prime the set of all passes in Q. So this set doesn't contain the special symbol zero. So P sub Q prime is equal to P sub Q minus zero. Denote by KQ the vector space over K with a distinguished basis given by the elements in P prime sub Q. We can extend the concatenation of paths to a binary operation on this vector space by bilinearity. And in particular, we can now use the zero element in our vector space as our special symbol zero. And it is very easy to check that this vector space, with respect to the extended bilinear concatenation, and with respect to the special element, which is given by the sum of all trivial passes with unit coefficients, this is a k-algebra. So this k-algebra is called the path algebra of q. Note that our sum, which gives our unit element in our algebra, is finite because it's taken over all vertices in q, and we assume that q is a finite quiver. So it has finitely many vertices. So this is a well-defined element of our vector space. Here is an example. We look at the quiver consisting of two vertices 1 and 2, and one arrow alpha from 1 to 2. 
Then the set of all passes in this cleaver has three elements, E1, the trivial pass in one, E2, the trivial path in two, and alpha. And the multiplication table in this distinguished basis of the quiver algebra is given by the following table. So the non-zero multiplications are E1 times E1 is equal to E1, E2 times E2 is equal to E2, E2 times alpha is alpha, and alpha times E1 is alpha. And now we see is that if we send E1 to the following two times two matrix, 0, 0, 0, 1, if you send E2 to the following two times two matrix, 1, 0, 0, 0, and if you send alpha to the following two times two matrix, 0, 1, 0, 0, then we get an isomorphism between our pass algebra KQ and the algebra of all non-strictly upper triangular two times two matrices over K. Here is another example. Consider the quiver with one vertex one and one loop alpha from one to one. Then we have infinitely many paths in this semigroup. We have the trivial pass E1, we have alpha, we have alpha squared, alpha cubed, and so on. So we have infinitely many paths. And for simplicity, we can denote E1 as alpha to the power zero. And then the multiplication in this distinguished basis of the pass algebra is simply given by the following formula. So alpha to the power i times alpha to the power j is equal to alpha to the power i plus j for any non-negative integers i and j. So we readily see that the pass algebra for this quiver is isomorphic to the polynomial algebra in one variable, or it's actually equal to the polynomial algebra in one variable given by our pass alpha. It is a nice exercise to show that the set of all passes in Q is finite if and only if Q is finite and does not contain any oriented cycles. This is also known as an acyclic quiver. Some problems with questions at the end of the lecture. Question one, show that in any group the inverse of a given element is unique. Question two, let S comma dot be a semigroup. Assume that the symbol E is not an element in S. Show that the following is a monoid. As a set, we take S union with this symbol E. Then we have the operation bullet defined below and the element E as the identity element. And the operation bullet is defined as follows. So it is given by dot if both A and B are elements in S, then A bullet B is equal to A if B is equal to E, and A bullet B is equal to B if A is equal to E. Question three, prove that any finite semigroup contains an idempotent, that is an element S, such that its square is the element itself. Question four, check with all details that the set of all passes, including the special symbol zero, is a semigroup with respect to the concatenation of paths. Question five, show that the pass semigroup of a quiver is a monoid if and only if the quiver has exactly one vertex. Thank you very much and see you next time.